This is the um, fourth session now in our series on countering patriarchal backlash. Um, and now Yurka will give us a little bit of a recap in a minute, but I just wanted to welcome you to the session today and give you a bit of a sense of, um, of the purpose of the session. Um, so as you can see, we've had a couple of previous sessions that are really focusing on understanding backlash and its various manifestations um, and the various kind of arenas it plays out in different regional contexts, a bit of a historical context. Um, so now in the fourth and fifth session, what we really want to do is start moving towards more forward looking, um, you know, developing some strategies um, for those working with men and boys, men engage alliance and others um, to come together with feminist movements to start to think about how to counter this backlash. Um, so when we developed this series um, together with the Countering Backlash program and IDS, um, we really wanted to kind of center this theme in the symposium and we came up with the idea for this series. Um, but really it's turned out that backlash has been such a central theme to the whole symposium so far. Um, we've also had a series of six sessions on the New Men Engage discussion paper, um, which is looking at the context that we do this work in. And um, there's been a lot of overlap in topics there because really so much of the context that we do our work in, unfortunately, these days um, is shaped by backlash. And um, so there's been some really rich discussions in that series, as well as this one. Um, and many of the regional networks have also run sessions on backlash, which is great to see. Um, so it's been a really central feature of the symposium. And what we've really noticed in all of these sessions is that the chat box has been really lively, that people have been really engaged, um, and people have a lot to say on this issue. Um, so what we wanted to do today is just kind of create a space to hear from you and to actually have a bit of a discussion. Um, so there aren't really kind of speakers or a panel as such today. It's really meant to be an open space. We're going to have some breakout room discussions um, and, yeah, really um, hear from you and begin to strategize about what we're gonna do um, going forward. Um, so before I go into kind of the details of how we're gonna do that and the format of today's session, I'm going to pass you over to Yerker who has been leading the series as well um, to just kind of give us some highlights of the session so far, maybe rejig our memories or for those who may not have met, uh, sorry, may not have been able to join some of the sessions um, and just to kind of, I guess, inspire some of the discussion today. All right, over to you Yerker. And thanks, thanks, Jeanette. Um, yeah, so there's so much has been um, discussed over the three first sessions. It's actually really hard to summarize, but it's good that you have the overview of the sessions here. The first session on understanding the global tide of, of backlash was meant to start really with a big picture. So we took, um, we had presentations from Sana Contractor from CHSJ in India as well as Eva Zelen from Kvinna to Kvinna based in Sweden, who gave us um, uh, quite a chillingly resonating perspectives from of backlash from uh, both India and the European, broader European region, as well as the, the, the kind of um, Middle East region a little bit, um, kind of focusing on ethno-nationalism and uh, majoritarian identity politics in those regions kind of link between um, gender backlash and uh, ethnic identity in particular and, and kind of far right politics. Then we took a more north south perspective where David uh, Chimba from Refugee Law Project in Uganda and Alan Gregg from the Challenging Male Supremacy Project in New York talked more about issues of white, white supremacy and colonial legacies and how those have shaped uh, backlash. I, um, differently in the US and in Uganda, North and South, as it were. Um, again, these were very rich discussions. Um, uh, and uh, out of that particular discussion, some really interesting reflections about um, both the kind of ideas of racialized entitlement um, becomes naturalized, and but also the, the power politics and the long history of colonialism, understanding that even in the US, but particularly so in, in, in the African context. The third conversation in that session was between Denise Candioti uh, from SOA, School of Oriental and African Studies in London, uh, along with Sonia Correa from ABIA, which is um, the Brazilian um, Interdisciplinary Association on AIDS, uh, who uh, discussed basically backlash in the 
the long term, the big picture, connected different contexts and continents and time scales, essentially, exploring the links between anti-gender backlash, religious conservatism, and authoritarian politics um, through diverse histories, um, and connecting those with current dynamics of backlash in different regions, going sort of um, local to global, if you were, if you like, as well as transnational in terms of um, global are interconnected. Um, again, I can't really um, pull out too many specifics from that wide ranging discussion, but it was fascinating. And we really got the longer view of kind of Sonia taking us back to the uh, Catholic cradle in the transition between the Cairo and the Beijing conferences where gender trouble um, of the Vatican erupted essentially. Uh, but going further back to the 70s and the, the moral majority movement in the US um, and then anti-Marxist discourses going further back. Um, so uh, yeah, fascinating, important discussion about looking at the big picture and the long term. And we had a, a wide ranging and deep discussion about neoliberalism and how that is mutating in very kind of gendered ways. Uh, very academic, that first session it has to be said, but thought-provoking, and it, uh, it was good for leading into the second session, which was on backlash, uh, body politics, and online misogyny, uh, where we had a, another set of really fascinating discussions, but getting a bit more concrete uh, and uh, current in terms of, uh, uh, well, starting with the online world, really, um, looking at different forms of backlash in digital space and the manosphere, um, as well as body politics in terms of the sexual and reproductive health and rights in different countries. So on the first topic, Alex DeBranco from uh, the US-based Institute of Male Supremacy, male supremacy, focused on uh, kind of the radical male supremacist, supremacist movements in the US and the US online, targeting feminism with viral messaging and, and um, in terms of their sexuality and rights with lots of fascinating and examples from Gamergate, pickup artists, um, incel hate campaigns. Uh, some, some of it getting quite technical for, for those of us who are a li little bit more out of date with the technology, but uh, a very fascinating discussion. Becky Faith from IDS took us through a fascinating analysis of backlash against feminism and online as well as offline violence and, and the bridge between the two, covering misogynist digital violence in the manosphere, as well as the more structural violence, if you like, of the digital platforms in the broader manosphere, sorry, and the broader digital industry in different settings, presenting a framework uh, that laid out layers of visibility of digital power, if you like. Uh, again, a fascinating discussion. Uh, on the more specific issues on geographically kind of contextualized um, SRHR battles. We had we had a talk from Maria Alicia uh, Gutierrez um, in Spanish, which unfortunately I didn't capture too much of, uh, but I understood that she was discussing um, backlash against SRHR in intersectional terms, particularly in, in Argentina. Certainly a question came up about that. Sabina Rashid from Bangladesh, the Jim Grant School of Public Health. Um, she linked the backlash on, on sex, sexual reproductive health and rights uh, to the criminalization and backlash against sexual minorities, LGBTQI groups, as well as the broader shrinking civic space. Um, for example, a new, with the new Digital Security Act uh, that also links national sentiment to religious sensitivities. Um, so there was a fascinating discussion around the links there between the religious interests as well as um, uh, other more secular concerns. Now we had a uh, contribution from Neil Dutta, the European Parliamentary Forum for Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights, who um, described the focus of their forum in Europe changing from a very kind of comfortable, we, we know what we're doing in Europe to having to understand what is actually going on with uh, what he described as old anti-abortion forces having broadened their attacks to LGBTI rights, um, as well as broader issues of gender and sexual and, and gender-based violence. 
picking up on sec uh, their use of children's rights, for example, being mobilized, and the idea of arguing um, that minority protections are basically conflicting with uh, religious um, communities' rights. Uh, he pointed to two trends there, professionalization of these movements, as well as an international network building and, and development. The, the ensuing debate there was really fascinating where he con connected three types of movements uh, from religious communities, older movements, from religious communities um, with their normative agendas, the far right fascist movements that are, are long lived, uh, but have come, come up lately, as well as populism as a force uh, of a more opportunistic kinds all coming together. And he used the example of the Trump's MAGA movement as a, as a good case study of that, where, where Steve Bannon is the far right um, person. Mike Pence uh, represents the religious groups and Trump himself, of course, the populist, etc. Now the third session, I'm probably talking too much. The third session um, was really, um, fascinating for me. We called it hijacking gender uh, backlash in policy and practice. And that is, becomes very relevant for this session, I think, about thinking about what groups can do, what we can do um, in engaging with policy. Uh, we had, um, we're basically focusing on anti-feminist backlash and co-option in policy and its implications for policy and practice. We had two sets of conversations. The first one was really building on uh, some literature reviews going on in Uganda and, in, and India by Eamon, um, uh, sorry, I'm missing the names here, uh, sorry, Eamon Mwine from CBR, Uganda, uh, as well as Sudarshana Kundu from Gender at Work in India. They've been doing um, literature reviews and policy mappings uh, of backlash. And they were looking at sort of what does it look like in India and, and Uganda in terms of how policies are becoming, have become co-opted and manipulated and what's the politics of that. Tessa Lewin, Lewin from IDS, um, who is a co-lead of the Strand on Policy and Practice under the Countering Backlash Program, presented an interesting um, conceptual approach and framework where she's picking out this idea of discourse capture uh, focusing on open and visible sort of power and threats and backlash on the one end of a scale to much more covert and hidden uh, power and and, uh, and threat. And there, there's this idea of discourse capture that she's using to, to um, unpick that and how in these machinations of co-option in policy, etc., discourse is being captured and repurposed by backlash forces and interests. Then there was a break in the session where Andrea Cornwall, also from SOAS, um, and formerly the director of uh, the uh, Network for Women's Empowerment, uh, what, sorry, what's it called? Uh, 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 Pathways to Women's Empowerment Network. Anyway, she uh, gave a really fascinating set of reflections from personal observations at CSW over the years and other spaces like um, Women Deliver and so on, uh, where she went into the sort of the backlash, the machinations of, of gendered policy in these spaces and how uh, these very conservative or, or right-wing or religious groups have come together in those spaces and essentially um, captured those spaces and, and uh, it was a really fascinating um, conversation, followed then by Laura Turquette from UN Women and Lena Carlson, the gender advisor at Swedish uh, CEDA, uh, reflecting on how policy frameworks and approaches are restraining or enabling backlash within the policy process of the multi and bilateral uh, development corporation agencies. Um, Laura talked a lot about the use of evidence and, and how that, uh, you know, producing reports and evidence, um, how that gets quite politicized and, and driven by background interests that are sitting in broader trends. Um, and Lena, of course, uh, from Sweden, discussing a little bit about how the, the formation is about different bilateral governments um, takes on this and, you know, 
the degree to which like-minded governments, if you like, can be a, uh, a force together and, and or engage with or negotiate with more right, hard line backlash forces, if you like. I'm probably not doing that discussion enough justice here, but just to give you a general flavor of what the three earlier sessions have, composed, uh, have been composed of, as I mentioned, each session has been such a rich and stimulating um, set of discussion earlier today and yesterday. I've been trying to go through them in my notes and summarize them and realizing that actually we should try and write write this up in, in slightly longer and more kind of a coherent <laughs> approach. But today's session will be great to hopefully take your experiences for you to reflect on some of these issues and think about, <clears throat> yeah, what, what do we do in terms of engaging with movement building? What does it mean for members of an engaged alliance or similar organizations working to engage men and boys? Uh, what does it mean in terms of linking with feminist movements and or other movements? Um, what are the contradictions? What are some of our uh, issues we have to resolve? So I'll hand back to Shinera that, that note and see how we move forward. Great, thanks so much, Erker. Um, yeah, as you can see, there's been some very rich discussions and um, I do encourage you to check them out um, if you missed them. They're um, all available on the Men Engage YouTube channel and also on the Symposium app. Um, so yeah, would encourage you to check those out. And of course, on the 1st of June, then, as you can see here, we will be attempting to wrap up the series and um, kind of bringing together the various um, the re with the regional network, some of the leadership from Men Engage with some feminist partners to kind of, um, yeah, set some commitments or what we're gonna do over the coming years um, to address this issue. Um, we don't have a title yet, as you can see, but keep an eye out for that. It will be on the 1st of June and we use some of the inputs from the conversation today, hopefully to kind of summarize, um, summarize the series a bit more. Um, so um, the format, sorry now, yeah, so, as I was saying, with the backlash becoming such a central part of the symposium, I think on one hand, of course, it's very it's reflective of the very worrying state of the world that we find ourselves in today. Um, but on the other hand, is a positive sign in the sense that I think men engage alliance organizations and others working with men and boys are there's a growing kind of acknowledgement of the fact that this is an issue that we need to be addressing and that we have a responsibility to address. Um, so we have been having conversations on backlash as men engage for a number of years, um, but in our new strategic plan that we've launched this year, um, we make a commitment, a specific commitment to addressing backlash, which I just wanted to share with you all as well, um, as it's part of this conversation. Um, so we've committed to strengthening collective actions by our members and partners to challenge backlash against gender justice and human rights, including by anti-feminist men and men's groups. And part of that um, is to develop a learning initiative um, and a strategy on how to better understand and respond to backlash um, from a feminist informed men and masculinities perspective. Um, we also want to synthesize and disseminate feminist critical analysis of men's rights or anti-feminist movements and related discourses. Um, we want to um, gather and communicate lessons on how members and partners are confronting men's rights and anti-feminist messaging, conservative movements, um, and develop a strategy on countering backlash in men's rights organizations. Um, and generally to be more vocal on countering anti-feminist narratives, including elevating messages from members and partners doing this work. Um, so I just wanted to share that that's the commitment that we have, but part of this discussion really is about this learning initiative. The symposium has been a learning initiative on this issue and we are going to be synthesizing um, a lot of the lessons from th the symposium sessions on this theme throughout into some sort of report or discussion paper at the end. So look out for that, um, which will then help us inform this strategy and the work that we're gonna be doing over the next few years. Um, so the format for the session today is gonna to be two breakout room uh, discussions. Um, the first one is about sharing strategies and tactics to counter backlash. So this one is more about kind of sharing strategies that we know are happening from feminist organizations, from our own organizations, and what individual, um, individual organizations working with men and boys can do about backlash and what we can do as a global alliance. 
just just a few questions. I think it might be a lot to get to in 25 minutes, but we'll see how we go. And then the second one, building on that, is more about kind of building movements to counter backlash. So how do we support the initiatives that are already out there from feminists and other social justice movements? And how do we come together as a global movement to counter backlash? Um, so we'll have uh, 25 minutes in the breakout rooms and then 20 minutes to share um, as, a, as a larger group. Um, of course, we don't have too many participants on the call, but we're going to have two groups today um, just to give us um, a little bit of a more intimate discussion. And we'll see how that works. Um, yeah, we'll see how it goes with the groups that we have. Um, we've assigned one of us from the team that was organizing the session into each group just to take some notes but it would be great if someone else could volunteer to do a bit of a feedback afterwards so it's not us talking the idea was that we gave you the space to talk and we've been talking now for 28 minutes um so i'm going to just divide us into the breakout rooms now um do let us know though if anyone has any questions or um feel free to write in the chat box as well throughout the session um okay that's enough from me i'm gonna just randomly assign the breakout groups now and we'll have about 25 minutes oh and sorry i forgot to <laughs> i forgot to say that these are the questions i'm going to post the questions to the breakout rooms i should have done that i think everyone's gone now okay great so you and i Jeanette, will be facilitating each group hopefully chloe and um, so i put you and it will be in separate groups too i've put you and yoni in one group um, you should be, have you got a thing to join it, an invitation? Yeah. And then myself and Chloe in the other, although I won't be able to join for one second because I'm currently host. So I'll, I'll, That's fine. I'll, I'll okay. be along in a second and I'll post these questions. See you in soon. Chat. See you soon. So perhaps uh, our group should start. Uh, you want, and then you can solve that dilemma in the meantime. <laughs> so Yoni, do you want to kick off and then invite others in our group to reflect? Yeah. Sure, um, I'll give it a try. Um, so in terms of what strategies you have used, we heard um, a couple of interesting experiences and work that's being done. Uh, we heard from the Brack School of Public Health uh, working on, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, working on creating critical conscience, consciousness on LGBTQI rights, on challenging deeply rooted patriarchal thoughts, and they do research-based advocacy and um, that then informs video documentary and newspaper articles. So basically doing research to understand um, how people perceive masculinities, how especially men uh, perceive manhood. And that then informs like kind of popular media. So video documentary, newspapers, etc. cetera. Um, so they mentioned doing research on masculinities and working with men in working men in the slums to understand their perspective perspectives of masculinities um, they're going to be doing research with youth um, and this will inform further targeted work on masculinities in the future so i think there was kind of a recognition that there's an area of understanding that needs to happen around what shapes masculinities as also then building areas of intervention um, then we heard um, experience from uh, Eswantini, which is the former uh, country called formerly Swaziland, uh, working with men and boys through male support groups um, and financial support and, uh, so, and linking that with social responsibility and how challenging it is to, uh, well, to challenge deeply rooted patriarchal norms in society, but basically taking the entry point of supporting men in the challenges that they're facing as an entry point to talk about uh, gender equality and countering what we were talking about, uh, toxicity, and how do we, how do you disconnect ma masculinities from individual men or from men's experiences, and how do you disconnect toxicity from that? Um, and then we heard from uh, the International Rescue Committee. They have the EMAC program working on male accountability. They also do radio programs to normalize alternative ways of being uh, to counter traditional and religious norms um, and to kind of replace them with alternative, you know, uh, gender norms um, and norms of nonviolence. And what can be done more to address the backlash? We talked about that a little bit. Um, um, 
I think I basically summarized that previously as well. And just pass it on to others in the group to uh, to add anything further. Uh, whilst waiting for others, uh, maybe I can add that that um, some thoughts about you know about what else. I guess we frame the question a little bit broader, like what is what we're doing adequate to the task? You know, in in the face of this onslaught of backlash or these dynamics and. Uh, one thing that Clement uh, mentioned from Southern Africa was the, the sort of deeply cultural rootedness of the work and how the way in which gender was originally presented in the country after Beijing uh, actually was counterproductive and men felt very much uh, held blamed for patriarchy in general um, maybe i'm, I'm uh, oversimplifying it here but um so that the need to demystify what gender actually is and correct those misunderstandings uh and the the way of you know the difficulties of engaging men in a more positive way whilst holding them to account also noting that there is some work going on on LGBTQ or sexual minority rights issues um, in the region, but but that's very nascent and uh, further away, and and possibly partly be, now I'm interpreting possibly partly because of the way that gender isn't really um, understood in in a in a in a locally negotiated way, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Laura, speaking about the IRC's work, was reflecting, I think, that there's a need to maybe spread the net a bit wider and not just focus on individuals in their communities, but look at kind of what, what are the police practices, what's going on in workplaces, and try to get a bigger picture to, uh, to address the problem at sort of all levels. Uh, and... Shireen came in uh, reflecting that Brack is also working to some extent in the NGO mode like IRC, uh, possibly differently, but also an NGO. And I was recalling the uh, contributions from Denise Candiotti and, and Son Sonia Correa that NGOization is part of the problem and that we don't need more gender trainings, which is a big challenge for, for you know, for anyone like us trying to work on this done a lot of trainings and we keep doing them. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer to that, but uh, yeah, and, and I think Brack's response to that is to engage with more different perspectives as an academic research um, advocacy uh, outfit, not just sort of move in the NGO world, but deal with um, Thinkers and actors in different, uh, from different perspectives and in in different uh, settings like the media and, and elsewhere. Sorry, that was just my ramblings on what else needs to be done. Um, um, a phrase came out from Clement, which was, "You can eat an elephant only at one bite at a time," <laughs> um, which is kind of a nice summing up of the the enormity of the problem and the fact that we still have to chip away at each uh, level and so on. Others, uh, Laura, Shireen, Clement, do you want to add to that? Or correct uh, either of our misrepresentations of your, your thoughts, Shireen? Clement? Ladies first. <laughs> Ladies first, Shireen or Laura, do you want to add anything? No, they're they're happy. Clement, go ahead. Right, I, I think my my mine is 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 um, a small one. Uh, you 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 did well in terms of representing what we said. Um, I, I think the space in which we operate in our in our setting, um, definitely, the issue of capacity and workshops and training is still supposed to be done because you can't demystify sitting at home. So you need to engage with the people. 
at at the lowest of the lowest levels because if you if you think about urban areas because this is just built around the way that we are um so you know that from an academic standpoint you can't change your behavior just by talking to people there's a need for us to look at uh, long term impact of some of the capacity initiatives and also uh, um using some of our opinion leaders in our context because we find some people who are opinion leaders then you are able to use them as um, ambassadors and uh, models of speaking for and against um and addressing and also demystify some of these issues otherwise um you 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 run the risk that if they don't um seem to be party to the discussion it really takes long for it to actually then start to to change people's behaviors so we need to engage at at the highest level um and get them to support some of the initiatives for advocacy purposes thanks thanks clamo so just to reflect tying what you just said back to what i said that denise and sonia had talked about and something that laura said in terms of spreading the net wider and working more with other institutions like workplaces and police and so on you yourself clemoth talked about working with uh, the religious um, ministries and so on uh Sonia and, and Denise saying, you know, working with the processes that are already in place and the institutions that are engaging in the politics of the everyday politics of the institutions that we live with um, and in. Uh, that might be one way of thinking about doing things slightly differently as opposed to an externally designed intervention for training to change a context. So being part of the context, challenging the context, and uh doing the politics that way okay any any final thoughts from our groups or or we hand over to the other group probably a good segue over to you shined and colleagues Thank yeah and um, would anyone from our like our group like to give a bit of a recap maybe savita would you like to have a go no i'm not sure i captured it all well i didn't take notes Okay, don't worry. <laughs> Maybe as the yeah, Chloe. Yeah, sure. So um, we had a good discussion. Um, so different strategies. So Savita, who is now working for, and please correct me if I'm wrong, working for um, uh, the SO in Mozambique, but remotely in India. Um, but she's been working for quite some time on these sorts of issues in India as well as in Mozambique. So one. Um, example that she gave us of how she addressed um how she worked in issues related to gender-based violence and backlash was to try and um so she gave an example how initially they were going to different communities and talking about kind of gender-based violence as rooted in power relations um but found that men um some of the men that they were engaging with were quite reactive and defensive to that idea um and also you know as 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 we know happens in many communities um it was never them who enacted gender based violence it was always the other community or the other village or the other country um so they kind of spoke about their approach and decided to try and focus on love relations so to try and appeal to the hearts of the people they were engaging with um rather than kind of appealing to their intellect so rather than talking about um women as wives and men as perpetrators of gender based violence against their wives they um spoke about um their sisters and kind of imagining and that shifting that relation from women as wives to women as sisters kind of shifted their perception of um how they understood and related to the conversation of gender based violence and then from that they then went back to thinking about power relations so they kind of tried to use an entry point that was um initiated a less defensive response so that was um one strategy and then i spoke actually to um of uh one of uh, brack so um naomi please apologies if i misrepresented but i was speaking about the how you're talking about working um 
on, interge in, on intergenerational issues in um, women's rights organisations and how, um, as I was saying, our Bangladeshi partners have, are speaking about um, an intergenerational divide that they can see in women's rights organisations and that building solidarity and networks across those generations would be a good strategy to counter backlash. Um, Sorry, I feel like I'm rambling because I'm going through all of my notes here. Um, Aishi, who is currently working as a consultant for CHSJ and preparing for her PhD, um, she spoke about how on one research programme that she's worked with on gender-based violence and resilience, um, they asked men to write letters rather than kind of working to understand their perspectives through interviewing and through questioning. Asking them to write letters kind of enabled them to express their emotions and their perceptions uh, in a different way and, and that she found that it was more kind of um, that it was more personal and that there were more emotions and that that helped her understand their standpoints and their perspectives a little bit more so um, kind of thinking about the ways in which we address and, and ask men about it was a strategy that they took to try and understand it. Um, so what more could you do to address backlash? So we spoke quite a lot on the first question. Um, on this, so yeah, and then we just kind of developed that a little bit more. So um, uh, Sinead spoke to appealing to hearts rather than fears. So that was kind of building on what um, Savita had already spoken about, about the um, kind of shifting from power relations to love relations back to power relations. Um, and also the need to think beyond kind of bounded projects as such and to think about networks, which then moved to our third um, discussion, which was around the role of men engage as a global alliance. And so um, Savita was noting that um, backlash is often subtle and sometimes loud. So having some kind of document that um, is produced that really speaks to different examples of backlash in different countries and how different people experience backlash at different intersections. So just basically a deeper understanding of backlash, um, which is something Countering Backlash Programme is working on. So watch this space, uh, Savita, hopefully we'll be producing publications on that soon. Um, and they're also kind of out of that. So the first point being understanding backlash, but then um, through kind of that networked understanding of it to think through kind of a menu of different strategies and how different strategies have worked in different contexts so that um, different people and different organizations and different stakeholders can kind of pick and choose different strategies that other people have found successful so just really kind of um, putting it out there I think and so that other people can learn from it um, and yeah and then again we spoke about the need to build networks and alliances uh, globally so I think that was quite a lengthy summary. So if anyone else has anything to add, please do. That was a great summary. Thanks, Chloe. Does Savita or Aishi, would you like to add anything? No, I think Chloe summarized it very well. So nothing to add. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And sorry, Aishi, I didn't get that. I think I didn't have anything to add. OK, great. <laughs> um, Great, so many good ideas there. Um, before we move on, would anyone like to comment on what's been shared by the other group? Just for me to say, um, thanks for the feedback there, Chloe. And um, yeah, th those are some really useful useful pointers and so on. And, and the last point in particular, the reminder for us, uh, including Shireen in Bangladesh and, and uh, sort of thinking about you know, how our work and research becomes useful, becomes translatable into uh, accessible formats for, for members of the Alliance. I guess it also relates to this series of, of um, sessions at, at Ubuntu, how do we, how we document that and make it available um, after the fact. Um, when I was writing up some notes today, I thought, you know, there's some really important, useful ideas here. But the, the problem is kind of packaging it in a way that can easily be accessible and uh, maybe with links to other resources and so on, but all for a longer um, discussion. I mean, we have another five years or another four years on this program. Uh, but of course, the backlash doesn't wait. So we can, there's, there's some urgency to it as well. Any other reflections, thoughts, where we are so far? I guess 
one reflection I had was just around, um, and I think I've said this in kind of one of our um, last sessions, was just on the role of emotion in this and how um, sometimes when you're working in academia, you kind of, um, emotion gets taken out of it, I find. And that actually, you know, it, this is, as as we've, I liked the um, the elephant, eating an elephant one mouthful at a time, that it can be very exhausting. So I think, um, it's, I mean, it's really nice actually to have like a small space because people are, I don't know, it can just be very exhausting to, to push up against a, a massive wall. <laughs> and so I think kind of talking about self-care and um, solidarity and that sort of aspect of it is, is as important as, as important and as political as talking about, um, you know, these huge structures and these huge structures of violence that we're pushing against. And I think that came out a bit in our discussion as well in the way of kind of connecting with backlash actors. I think it's as important in thinking about countering backlash. One of my one of my worries, I know I, I, there's a party at my house. One of my kids is turning seven, so please pardon the noise. Um, I'm trying to work and everyone is having a, a blast. What, one of the challenges that I, I've actually seen is um you know when we deal with engaging men every time we deal with men we have to nurse them we have to massage them we have to negotiate them we have to create uh put up uh sports bars and tv programs just to get them to speak about some of these things but i've seen i've seen a turn of events because in our context, we are seeing a lot of men now who have either had a, a daughter or um, or someone or a wife that has been attacked or something of that sort. So now we are seeing them coming out now to say, what is it that we can do to actually change the narrative? And, and that for me uh, 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 is a sign that whatever that we are doing, no matter how small it is, it does have an effect, um, it does have an impact. The, the noise we make when there's been um, an assault on someone, uh, when we actually, every time I speak, I, I always I always ensure that I, I bring the line that says, um, this can be perpetrated uh, by both males and females, but the most perpetrators are males. And when that happens, you see they raise their eyebrows to say, you know, maybe there's something we can do about it without being pushed. So wh what I'm thinking is, is maybe we, we should change, we should try and innovatively change the, the way we present um, engaging with men um, and have a crop now that's not being massaged or begged, but have a crop of men now that are male, positive male models. Because in our countries, I can assure you, we have thousands and thousands of men that are not that are engaging properly with different levels of groups. But uh, uh, um, if we can get those to be the ones that are towing the line in terms of uh, positive masculinities and engaging properly with their daughters and their sons, being positive parent, do, doing proper parenting. Some of us were, were parented by 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 a stick. We used to be beaten. We used to be beaten to be corrected. But now we are changing the narrative because that, if that happens, then we are we are starting a journey where they are going to compare themselves. It's going to be us and them. And if you use those rather than using a deficit approach, because a deficit approach is killing us. If we use a strengths approach, we would actually identify these men that are doing well, that are doing good, and then use them as models. I, I'm just I'm just rambling on. Please stop me if I'm talking too much. Thank you. Oh, Sorry. thank you, Clement. Can I just come in and, and uh, thank you for that comment because I often, both in research and in speaking to to groups working with men, activist groups in India in particular, uh, in my experience, also in Kenya, it's this notion of we don't actually need, we shouldn't be trying to work with all men, direct. we shouldn't be trying to change each man individually in a sense, it's a case of you don't, you know, like Clement saying, we have to find the right men and boys, perhaps, and empower them 
and and link them up and and build some kind of critical consciousness and community. Um, so Center of Health and Social Justice, who are not here today, sadly, I think uh, Satish was hoping to join, but he wasn't able to. They've been working with groups like Maswav, um, networks of male activists in universities and other places who support each other to build a critical consciousness and who are very, who become politically engaged um, at, at lots of different levels. But but seeing that as a long-term and intergenerational, as echoing Chloe there, intergenerational process where the older members support the younger members as well and build critical consciousness over time to, to engage in the, their daily politics. Um, sorry, I'm rambling too. Just wanted to echo that notion that we don't necessarily need to work with every man and some men are perhaps beyond reach and are going to um, hit back. Other men see every reason to join, you know, a struggle for equality. And it's a case of engaging with them and building trust and, and community and, and it's that kind of a shared identity as um, change agents, perhaps. Um, and then ideally linking that into other rooting that in, in other broader kind of processes uh, or, yeah, whether it is democracy processes or, you know, processes to deal with sexual harassment in universities, etc. So I'll shut up there, sorry. And hand back to Sinead. We were probably yeah, way no. over time. Thanks, Jerker, and thanks everyone for your inputs. I am keen to move on to the next set of questions, but it might make sense to just do it in the larger group. Um, I don't know what others think. Or should we go into breakout rooms? I can try and switch them around this time. Yeah? Okay. Um, so with the next, and apologies for not sharing the questions properly the last time, um, but moving on I, now, I guess, from um, individual organizations, because as we said, we're not going to be able to address backlash just with individual programs by individual NGOs, and even moving beyond networks like Men Engage Alliance. Um, with this set of questions, I wanted to discuss um, kind of building movements to counter backlash. So how can we strengthen, strengthen the broader movement for gender justice? Um, and how can the Alliance or others um, working to engage men and boys, not necessarily men engage members, but how can we support initiatives that are already out there? So lots of feminist networks are working on backlash and um, lots of strategies already out there. So how can we act in solidarity with these actors um, and strengthen and support these efforts? Um, and then related to that, what kind of partnerships do we need? Um, so maybe some less traditional ones, partnerships with, uh, as Yerker mentioned, it's not just about gender justice, it's also about social justice, racial justice, all these other movements. So what kind of partnerships do we need as men engage and as individual organizations? Um, what kind of partnerships do we need to build or strengthen to better counter backlash? Um, so again, lots of, lots of questions going on there. Um, but... Yeah. Does anyone want to start? What comes to mind? Can you can you share your screen again? Please don't, uh, so we can see the questions. Oh sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was just reading the first line and I was like, "What happened?" Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, no, take a minute to digest them. <laughs> I guess the first question is kind of overarching. It's a very broad question. Um, the second two kind of link to that, come out of that, maybe more specifically. Um, but if we're adopting Clement's methodology of eating an elephant one bite at a time, uh, the first question might be a big bite. <laughs> um, might be a mouthful. Um, but perhaps we can just approach it very, you know, randomly, you know, what is, you know, is there such a thing as a broader gender movement or what does that consist of? I mean, one, one issue in, in the broader gender movement is there are lots of divides within that broader gender movement, within feminism itself. Does anybody have any reflections on what that, what that implies, you know, yeah, what that means for us? 
in terms of backlash. I have a sense that splits within feminism or, or gender justice, if you like, is itself a point of weakness that is mobilized in the backlash. <laughs> oh yeah, 100%. I mean, divide and conquer is a, uh, a long known strategy of colonial patriarchy, right? <laughs> So like you can I think you can see that in the backlash in as much as you can see it in any um you know structure of power and control and domination is that whether it's strategic or not, but that looking for kind of cleavages and cracks and just playing on them and pulling them apart. I mean in, in for example, in the UK, the Gender Recognition Act, um, the whole dialogue and debate around that that there was certainly kind of patriarchal backlash and um, gender critical feminists kind of whether they were working together consciously, but their arguments are essentially the same that sex and gender shouldn't be separated. And, you know, that that whole kind of dialogue played out um, very much kind of um, calling on those those splits within feminism. This to some extent. Um, there's something said in our group um, in relation to the first set of questions around how this is being addressed. Um, in Bangladesh, for example, Shireen mentioned that the focusing on, on sex, sexual minority rights as well as, as gender more broadly, and in relation to um, the challenges of shrinking civic space, and uh, maybe that wasn't from there, but but yeah, so broadening it to look at yeah, Shireen mentioned that a kind of radical um, reading of, of patriarchal oppression. Uh, and from Clement, we heard a slightly different approach uh, in, in, in your context, where it was a case of correcting the wrongs of a misinterpretation of gender from, Be from the days of Beijing and how it was imposed on, on Africa, essentially, uh, where actually the LGBTQI question is very difficult to integrate yet, but it's still a matter of rediscovering what gender, what the gender issue is locally and how that movement can be built. So is there something around, um, you know, in order to strengthen the broader movement, there needs to be, you know, even deeper or fundamental debates to bring the movement together. I mean, maybe that's optimistic, um, but I, I do feel that there is uh, there's a real, it's a very difficult area, especially when you're dealing with masculinities and, and engaging men, to point your finger at feminist movements as divided and split and so on. But the reality is that those splits exist. And, um, and we need to engage in that difficult conversation without appearing to be men taking over the debate. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. Okay, can, I, can I just add something? Then? Um, one of the things that I was, I'm just thinking about now is um, most of the things that uh, we are struggling with uh, with regards to um, engaging men and, and gender issues are, are made or broken at family level. That, that becomes our starting point because socialization is, is built around what we saw from our parents or, or we, what we didn't see our parents do because uh, that that can also be a point of socialization. The things that I didn't see, experience, I didn't experience, I look for them outside the ambit of the family. And I've always believed that if we, if we, I've got two boys, one is 11, the other one is turning seven today. And if, if I, from a family perspective, I'm able to make them understand that the sister that comes to visit, the cousin, is their sister and is their equal. There's no need for power dynamics because men in our context they get it from the family to say you're a man, 
Why are you crying? You can't cry. You're a man. Man up. Uh, we speak about you've got no balls if you are a man that cries. So the, the starting point for me is the family. And then from, from at community level, for those who are already way past their socialization uh, context, we have systems around them which can influence them positively. I spoke about positive male models who we can use as influencers. I'm in a group like in a Swati, in a group of seven men going to a car wash to wash their cars. Two of them will be good men, but five will not be, will be bad men. And the five will try and influence the two. But what if we turn that around the two influence the five? Because it should, it, it, it's not the majority all the time. But it's, it's about how the two are able to present the story of, 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 mas of positive masculinities. And also minimizing, because we get backlash. I speak, I, I mean, I told you I'm, a, I'm also, I also run a church. I speak on social media, but I go on YouTube and I speak on radio. And most men will say to me, you are speaking like this because things are still okay with you. What if things change tomorrow? But the narrative should not change because things have changed with me. It should become something embedded in us from a socialization standpoint, and then use systems that are external from the family that are going to influence positively. So for me is family. The second one is proper dialogue. We, we, because right now we, we, we hide behind issues like this is a convention that comes from externally. It's not, a, it's not our culture, it's not our practice. This is not who we are. And then we say, oh, that law is actually a convention that comes from outside. It's an influence that comes from outside. But if we get Swazi men or African men or European men who are going to actually lead the dialogue, I always believe that we, if we lead the dialogue and discuss these issues and talk about the backlash also and correct some of these things, then we are most likely, that's my assumption, we're most likely to win. And also then correct these issues of extreme I, I always call it, uh, I, I have a lot of friends who are, extreme, who are extreme in terms of their presentation, which then tends to make people shut down. The moment you speak, they just shut down. But if we were to do it properly, teach a concept, teach a principle, leave and, and have examples of people who are living like that. In, such, in, that, in that way, we are cheaping at it slowly because... We, we, once we rush at it, then we lose a lot of people. Yeah. But that, that's, that, that's just me throwing it out there. Anyways. No, thanks, Clement, for that. Um, yeah, we've been talking a lot. It would be great to hear from some of the others who haven't spoken so much. Maybe um, Laura or Shireen or Savita or Aishi, who want to come in on any of the questions that we've, we've been discussing so far. Hello, Savita here. I was just thinking about a couple of points. One, my experience is the backlash doesn't come only from men. Like if you see Indian context in many of the Asian contexts, even in some way African context also I have seen, the backlash also comes from women. I mean, it's the women who sometimes oppose the girls to go to and study to school. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not generalizing, but we have to understand that it's not only men who are opposing, it's also women because both men and women are coming from the same patriarchal system. So just like we always say to women's organizations that women's organizations also need to work with men, I think men engage and its alliances also need to work with women because the context of men human relation uh, men women relationship is always changing though some of the things remain the same the, basically the power relation remains the same but things keep on changing so uh, men are also changing based on their context how it is changing so i think that's one aspect which we really, really need to uh, focus on more also i think that um, my experience in India is most of the people who focus or understand are passionate about gender justice and all those, they are all in the sector of NGO. They are not in the sector of like 
music or films or politics or i mean there are so many other sectors of life so it's not integrated into general kind of what's happening in the society we are like okay yeah 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 you are a gender person even within the ngos there is a gender person if some something related to women's meeting comes people say oh savita this is related to gender so you please look after it so i think the major challenge is how to really integrate this concept this understanding this progress into different sectors of life and especially when we are talking about youth how are the songs written how is the music received what are the films what do they when you, when they go to trekking i mean there are so many different things we need really so sometimes i feel we we have created our own little world i'm sorry i'm not generalizing i'm talking about myself and we are trying to look at that world from our point of view but we really need to understand what's happening and how that that both these worlds like one we are sitting with these concepts and the other world who is not aware of these concepts how we are going to bridge the gap that that's the major challenge for me thank you i think something that has taken up this year is to understand how grassroots movements uh, led by men might not be all, always they are working on feminist issues but how to bring them together in one platform and you know sometimes like people working in education and you know are not directly engaged in gender but uh, and like you know sometimes uh, people like men working in the field of the men of social entrepreneurship so how to bring these feminist men groups together in a common platform uh, who are working on grassroots based mobilizations and not necessarily ngos and also working on uh, health seeking behavior of men because before we start on training them on gender like how to work on uh, uh, training them to seek help uh, regarding their own mental health and uh, physical health in context of india because i have worked on mental health uh, separately in rural india but i feel that there needs to be a uh, more uh, you know facility for health seeking behavior of men and our curriculum for the mental health should be differently built uh, for the future yeah um i'll just add um that i agree that the some of the research that we've done um shows like the cultural aspects of um basically the perceptions of ex ex acceptable views of violence and some some women actually see violent behavior as as a way of um their partner showing love and so just kind of so if they're not showing violence and they also feel like they're not loved because that's normal like the norm in the in the villages or or wherever they are um and so just yeah kind of un unpacking that on on the women side of things as well um addressing those kind of perceptions and also also there's been an interesting um view on what what constitutes violence in general from the men's side because they they might there's a lot of gaps around um sexual violence and things because um they don't associate sex or sexual acts necessarily um as violence even though they that may be happening in their house but they wouldn't consider themselves violent so even the detachment from um what they consider as harmful behavior or hurtful um is also quite physical and um yeah very very specific on like punching or slapping um so yeah kind of breaking that down is really important for for everyone but yeah just wanted to add that I think uh, we need to engage with conversation like more um, and with some perspective which you don't like so it is the it is about engaging in a difficult conversation through different type of creative uh, projects and to see why this perspective originated like in Bangladesh feminism has been considered to be um, not in general but uh, as a Western version of feminism or something 
uh, not goes very well with religious beliefs, not goes very well with cultural identity. So I think we need to unpack those conversations and engage with both feminist and non-feminist stakeholder to know how we can proceed together. And by doing so, we can strengthen the gender rights movement. So I think we can start with um, getting engaged with conversation, in a difficult conversation, I think. There's some great uh, reflections there from all of you. Um, just something Savita said, uh, which I found really refreshingly radical, um, was the idea that men engage needs to work with women in a similar way to, uh, maybe I'm overinterpreting this, but in a similar way to which women's movements may need work to with men. Um, because obviously I, I think it's been quite difficult. I mean, men engage has also changed. Yoni and, and Shanet can come in on this as well. I mean, men engage now, I think about a third of members are organizations run by women or women's organizations of some description. So it's no longer an organis a network of men's organizations, yet the focus is to work with men and boys. That That is the, the central sort of theme of Men Engage, I guess, uh, apparently in the name. Uh, but it does raise an interesting question, you know, should organizations working with men and boys or masculinities also not have to or be encouraged to work with women on those difficult issues like, uh, as Laura says, seeing violence as a sign of love or, and so on and so on. Um, and it raises, it echoes back to my question earlier about how should men engage, engage in the difficulties of the splits within feminism? Um, do, does the alliance take a stand on those debates and different forms of feminism, for example, or different arguments in feminism? Shineda or, or Yoni, do you want to reflect on that? Sure. So I think, yeah, you already referenced the shift in Men Engage. I think um, the membership has always consisted of a very diverse group of organizations. It's never been an alliance of, of men's organizations. It's always had, like, I think at the Delhi Symposium, which was in 2014, there was one third of participants or so that identified as women's rights organizations and we did a mapping a couple of years before that of how organizations and members identify and we know that many of them do actually self-identify as women's rights organizations primarily so um yeah just i don't think we've ever been an alliance of, of men for men and the name is men engage but i think also the agenda itself has broadened so yes, it is about engaging men and boys, but it is towards transforming patriarchal masculinities or eliminating <laughs> patriarchal masculinities, if you will. And I think more broadly, eliminating patriarchy. And I think the journey that the Ubuntu Symposium shows and the conversation we're having now is that we're looking much more at like patriarchy is at the basis also what's wrong with economic systems and it's what's even at the you know the basis of climate change patriarchal masculinities have a lot to do with that so it's really shifting and looking at how micro level power inequalities and gender inequalities work but also macro level um, and i think a lot of the backlash that we are talking about now actually has also a lot to do with macro uh, systems and economic systems and haves and have nots in the world and so I think if we really want to meaningfully challenge backlash for lack of a better word it is about looking at the international uh, systems and streams of power as well so I think yeah men engage has broadened this scope and that links to the second question that is outlined there. How do we work with other movements more? I think we we have to, because at the end, I think the issues we're facing are not just about gender inequalities in isolation. 
but like I said, they are about power inequalities in many different forms. No, so throughout the Ubuntu Symposium, we've been talking about uh, racism. We've been talking, of course, about LGBTQI rights. Um, I already referenced economic injustices and um, and climate injustice. But yeah, um, and then your question around. Um, how do we take stands on issues where the feminist movement is divided on? And that is an ongoing debate. Um, and there is no clear cut answer to that. I think um, sentimentally, there's a part of me that thinks that we cannot let ourselves get divided because our energy goes into to fighting, in fighting in a way, instead of challenging the big bad world out there. So I feel that there is a strategic advantage in a way to steering away from some of the the hot potato issues within the feminist movement. We've also said, you know, Men Engage considers itself part of the feminist movement, but it's not up to us as we focus on men and masculinities to to deal with all the issues that the women's rights groups are divided on. At the same time, there is also uh, a recognition that we have to take stands on what our fundamental principles are, right? So when it comes to transgender rights, for example, which is one of the hot potato issues, we are very clear. We are for safety, security, freedom from everybody, and that includes transgender people. You know? So any harms done against transgender people, we are firmly against it. We're transgender inclusive. So... Um, I think there are a number of other issues. The issue of sex work and prostitution is is another one where um, you know we are working to try and see what is it that we can take stands on from a man and masculinity's perspective without um, claiming that we're in the position to resolve the whole issue. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Joni. Yeah, I know the last point has been a uh, contentious issue for the alliance for some time. Um, and of course, that very difficult in relation to feminism too, because it's contentious within feminism. And particularly if you look at the intersectionality with economic rights and sex workers, workers, uh, rights as workers, or that, that whole debate. Yeah, sorry if I'm segueing there. So let's move on to the second question. Are there specifics that we can think of in terms of Yoni's race? So some of the obvious movements are around race, LGBT rights, so sexual rights, economic rights. I can't remember the fourth one if it was oh, env environmental rights uh, or environmental movement, I guess. Um, what do we see as... Um, what do you see as as uh, how men engage should link to those or with engage with support? Um, racism is very different. Race, you know, race movement, race anti-racist movements are very different. I guess depending on where you are in Southern Africa, it looks very different from in the U.S., for example. Um, but there are some common historical roots. Um, and in Southern Africa, perhaps it's not thought of as much about as race as about ethnicity or, or, or other issues. Any thoughts? Intersectional feminism. Sorry, I'm just going to post the questions in the chat because I saw Chloe ask for them there. Although I think we've kind of got slightly derailed, so I don't think we need to stick so tightly to these. I mean, I, I said it in our breakout area, but I would love to see um, like compulsory training in workplaces. Um, and I think that's not just on like gender issues, but also on like racial issues, you know, basically everything, um, because if, especially like for the IRC, for example, we um, 
our values, our accountability, integrity and equality, um, but we we don't have any compulsory training at the moment um, or like onboarding materials or compulsory workshops. We have one, one um, workshop once a year, which is kind of like an all day thing of training. But yeah, I think it's good to have to be embodying those things as an organization as well, because how you are in the world also affects how you are in your work and how you are like creating the programs for the communities that you're serving or um, the way that you're even looking at like budgets and where you're allocating money and kind of breaking down the things that do influences the do influence the way you work and where the money goes and who's who's getting um, the most support or you know, because I do think, you know, we all carry biases. And I think I've read something before, but um, basically along the lines of that, we all, a lot of, a lot of people that work in the humanitarian sector, especially um, think of themselves as inherently good. So they don't, they don't need any like training or any more um, reflection or, or there's no improvements to be made. And I think, um that is just insane. Um, and I think I, I don't disagree and it's hard not to think of everyone to not think that they're a good person, but I think just kind of just taking just taking away that uncomfortability of like looking at how we are in the world and how we how we're yeah, how we're being and enabling and in, and contributing to all of these issues. Um, so yeah, I would like to see that be like compulsory in workplaces and um yeah, and, and on in an ongoing way, not just in your onboarding, you do a tick box function, but something that's, you know, it's tracked by HR or whatever to to make sure that you're con you're consistently questioning your privilege and and how these things show up in your personal life and in your work life and really embodying um, what we want to see in the world. Other thoughts? Just a quick reflection on that for me is is that um, that that's definitely it would be an improvement to where we are in terms of the organizations most of us inhabit and so on. But I also can't help thinking that increasing numbers of people in the world don't have the luxury of having a workplace or, or uh, an organization to fall back on. And it, it may not be enough, uh, but, but definitely important part of the problem possibly. I would just add to that, like in terms of if we did have that kind of like training and stuff, then we could also potentially coordinate resources to give out to communities, um, booklets or things that they can do in their own languages that's maybe a bit more culturally appropriate or tweaked or whatever where relevant. But um, yeah, I think that being expand, expansion on the same kind of core workings, I think. Others? I uh, the backlash has also made us think the value of quality education, like in Bangladesh, the education rate is on high rise. But still, when we see the result of the backlash and the way women are being targeted in the cyber place, we tend to question that what is the use of education, like of this, you know, high literacy rate, that even the educated uh, men and women are engaged in attacking women, humiliating women in the digital space. So I think whether do we need to think that how can we um, uh, how can we actually engage uh, both men and women with a critical consciousness uh, since childhood, so they can actually grow up as a human being who respect uh, gender justice. So it doesn't become a propaganda or a political movement or something which happened with some group of people. So it doesn't get confined uh, with some organizations. So it become like a, you know, human rights issue or something that everyone needs to talk about. Great, does anyone else have any, any thoughts or we can move on to just wrap it up and go on to some next steps? So anyone else, anything else anyone would like to share? Yurka, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, no, I'm, I'm just a little bit daunted by the question of how, I mean, I don't, I don't think we can solve it today, obviously, but <laughs> how we can and should work with other movements. And I guess, obviously, it's going to be very a context specific. Um, and the issues are going to be quite different in relation to different movements, but um, but I do yeah. But as you know, linking to the third question in terms of what the a lot I can't what the quest, third question was about 
what the alliance should do itself. Um, I think perhaps certain positions on certain things uh, will become helpful. I mean, you only mentioned uh, about LGBTI rights and, and uh, inclusion and, and having a stand on that. Uh, which I do think is probably helpful, uh, even if it does mean difficult negotiations at regional levels and sort of working that, what does that mean in regional levels and so on? Because the answer isn't that simple everywhere. It's difficult everywhere, but it's difficult differently uh, in Bangladesh or Europe from Southern Africa and so on. Uh, racism, again, similarly, I think, I don't think there are quick answers. Um, I think in, in general, and it's good to hear from Yoni the way that the conversations have been going around addressing patriarchy and the, the underlying foundations for that rooted in economic um, rights as well as, uh, as cultural race and so on. So that's a good direction to go in. Um, I guess it's a, it's a more positive way of, of reflecting on that. There, there aren't any quick answers, but um, going in that direction seems important and developing some positions might be helpful. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah, yeah I think, um, yeah, the whole issue of how to work across movements is, is so difficult and we don't have all the answers, but I think what's been really valuable of over the last well it will have been I think eight months of the Ubuntu symposium is that we've really had the time to have these conversations and invite people from other movements and there's been a growing recognition of the need to work with different movements and the interconnectedness of it all um, and the recognition of this need to move towards systems change so I think that's what's really come out of the last few months um, and something that we'll continue to work on um, over the next few years, I guess. Um, but it's really been a great step forward, I think. We've had so many rich conversations. Um, as I mentioned in my intro as well, I think the challenge coming up will be to, to distill some of the conversations, to distill all the knowledge that's been shared, um, to share it wider with, with people, because it's been very daunting for everyone. There's been a lot of sessions. Um, so we will be working on that. Um, we will be um, particularly focusing on this issue of backlash and kind of um, as a particular area of focus and developing some sort of some sort of report or discussion paper. Um, and yeah, in terms of the next steps, as I mentioned, we have our next um, backlash, final backlash, backlash session on the 1st of June. So it'd be great to see you all there that will kind of pull together all of these these um various different types of sessions that we've had um, and as i mentioned in the intro it's something that we're really committed to as men engage um to continue to learn and to create spaces like this about backlash and as savita mentioned it, it's very difficult to understand and i think still getting you know helping people to understand the complex nature of backlash is so important um and to begin to develop strategies to counter it um, so yeah, it's been really great um, talking to all of you today. Thank you so much for joining. Um, would anyone like to have any final words before we wrap up? I was just typing it, but um, I do think there's a like there's a lot of overlap in terms of the core ways to break down like the defensiveness for for the range of issues, the the defensiveness, um, the addressing the ego, creating that kind of unpacking that scraping off all the all of the harmful kind of attitudes and behaviors um that do overlap the issue so i think in i think in theory it seems more daunting than maybe it is of course everything would need to be tweaked but i think there's a lot of the same principles and and ways of doing things that that would work across the board um in theory um but i yeah i think it wouldn't doesn't have to be necessarily seen as like a mammoth task Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a last thought. That mammoth task echoes the eating the elephant one one bite at a time. I think that's the overriding um, imagery I have from this session, and I think it's it's quite sobering. It's it's a it's a good way to think about how to move forward. And I would just like to say, from countering backlash, uh, originally we had hoped to develop some 
training manuals for different regions so for countering backlash. We don't think that's a realistic uh, or appropriate approach right now, but we'd be very keen to sort of engage with Manage H uh, over the years as we go forward to figure out how we can come up with user-friendly and helpful ways of developing materials uh, for training or for for guidance of different kinds, whether it's for activists or researchers and or NGO uh, workers. So that's a thought uh, to leave Wonderful. on for us. Great. Cool. Thank you so much, Jurker and Chloe and everyone for joining. Um, we will see each other soon. Thanks, everyone.